for, for my kids, uh, for most of their lives, they've been early risers. You know, they've been uh, definitely the first ones up in the morning, uh, crawling uh, into bed with us and waking us up long before we'd like to uh, get out of bed. Uh, but I've noticed that in the last six months or so, especially with my daughter Jillian, uh, that, that she, she and, and Benjamin as well are wanting to sleep in more. And, and that's, that, I'm, I'm like, that's okay with me on, you know, most days to get a little bit more sleep myself. Uh, but I'm finding that, you know, increasingly I'm going to have to wake her up so that she has time to get ready for school and to get dressed and to eat breakfast and, and things like that. And I find myself doing what my mom did with me and my siblings when I was young. You know, silly things that try to help wake the kids up in a good mood. So, so I find myself si singing silly you know, wake up songs and improvising lyrics and trying to find funny ways to, to wake them up that way. Um, sometimes I'll pretend that Jillian is my pillow and I'll try to fluff her in order to, to lay and go to sleep on her. Something that I came up with this week that was kind of fun is uh, I pretended she was a piano and so I started playing classical music on her. Bum, 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 you know, and uh, it was a, she, she enjoyed that. Keep going, keep going. I'm like, no, it's supposed to get you out of bed. Um, and, and, and you know as parents, when you love your kids and you know that something is best for them, even when they're reluctant, you will increasingly do things to help prod them forward. And, and, and usually it starts small, but, but if it doesn't work, you kind of slowly turn the knob of discomfort up. You know, it, it might mean turning on the lights, it might mean like the video yanking off the covers, you know, might be playing music and then turning the volume up. It might, it might be, you know, warnings or threats, you know, if, you know, if you don't get out of bed, then no dessert for tonight or something like that. Or, or maybe as parents, you, you've taken a different approach and you're just like, well, you don't get out of bed, you're paying the consequences, you can find your own ride to school. Um, that works a little bit better for a high school student than a kindergartner, but... <laughs> Um, you know, whatever the approach might be, you know, as parents, when you love them, you will increasingly turn up that knob of discomfort to push them in the right direction, to do what they need to do. Uh, the same approach often works with what's been called the failure to launch syndrome. Uh, perhaps you've heard of this term before. It was popularized by a movie a few years ago with Matthew McConaughey and Sarah Jessica Parker. Not the, the pinnacle of uh, cinema, cinema excellence, but you know, I've sat through worse. Um, the, the term failure to launch essentially describes you know, 20 and 30 somethings who have a hard time getting motivated enough to get out of their parents' house. Uh, this phenomenon has been on the rise over the last 20 years or so, particularly among men uh, or man boys. I don't know, maybe we should, uh, you know, I don't want to be too critical, but um, the, uh, the Pew Research Center and the Population Reference Bureau uh, have estimated that roughly 40% of 18 to 31-year-old men and 20% of 25 to 34-year-old men live in their parents' basements or their childhood bedrooms. Now, I recognize, I don't want to paint with too broad a brushstroke, I recognize that not everyone who is living with mom and dad is just lazy and unmotivated and, and you're trying to, to, to milk, you know, free laundry and food as long as they can. Um, some people are strategically saving up to do what they need to do. And, and I recognize we're in different economic times, but, but there are certainly parents who have had to turn up the knob of discomfort to lovingly motivate their kids to move on to the next stage of life, to accept the fact that they're adults. I wonder how often God feels that way about us. I wonder how regularly he has a sense of frustration or disappointment as we cling to what is comfortable. Uh, and instead of following him down a path of risk, and difficulty and uncertainty. I'm beginning a sermon series today on the second section of the book of Acts. Um, I'm titling it The Church on the Move, and we'll be looking uh, at chapters 8 through 12 of the book of Acts. 
And it, I'm, I'm calling it the church on the move because in our passage today, at the beginning of Acts chapter 8, God decisively kind of pushes his kids out of bed. Um, you know, they, he's, maybe there's been some gradual things leading up to this, but it's essentially the moment where God's like, all right, tipping the mattress, you know, like you're getting out of, you're getting out of bed. I'm pushing you out of what's comfortable that you might be a church, not just comfortable where you are, but a church on the move, bringing the gospel beyond the walls of Jerusalem. It says, time to get going. And if you remember the beginning of the book of Acts, Jesus predicted this moment. Jesus said that this time was going to come. And I want you to look at that with me at the, in the first chapter of the book of Acts. Uh, chapter 1, verses 6 to 8, we see... Uh, Jesus, right before he ascends to heaven, kind of giving his last words to his disciples. And in Acts 1, verse 6, it says, So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? So th this is after the resurrection, before Jesus' ascension. And they're basically wondering, is now the moment where you're going to restore Israel to power and, and, and reign as king? You know, these prophecies that have been predicted of the Messiah coming to reign is now finally going to be the moment when you reign as king. And Jesus responds, verse 7, he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, verse 8 essentially functions as a table of contents for the book of Acts. Uh, but verse 8 kind of gives you a, a hint of what's coming later in the book of Acts. He says, you, you, know, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, which is what takes place in chapter 2 at, on the day of Pentecost, that the Holy Spirit descends and comes on the disciples, and they're uh, filled with the Spirit and empowered for uh, gospel ministry in, in the name of Christ. And so, so that's, that happens in chapter 2. And then this, there's kind of this, out, you know, this concentric circles moving out from Jerusalem. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This kind of increasing distance that you will go with the gospel. And chapters 1 to 7 essentially... Uh, tell the history of the first part of that, the, the disciples being witnesses in Jerusalem. Chapters 8 to 12 summarize the, the spreading of the gospel to Judea and Samaria. And chapters 13 and beyond essentially tell the story of the gospel beginning to go to the ends of the earth. A couple of years ago, uh, in the spring of 2014, uh, I preached a sermon series on the first section of the book of Acts, chapters 1 to 7. Uh, and I titled it, The Church on Fire. And for several months, we looked at the explosive growth of the early church and the, the, the passion and unity they shared as believers. And, uh, and as passionate as they were, uh, they seemed pretty content remaining in Jerusalem. Uh, a lot of people assume that the, the book of Acts uh, is the story of, of the church just kind of courageously going wherever, Don Richardson has an interesting observation. He says that while, mi while millions of Christians think that the book of Acts records the apostles' obedience to the Great Commission, it actually records their reluctance to obey it. By the end of chapter 7, the believers are still clustered in Jerusalem, and they don't seem to be making any plans to obey the rest of Jesus' last command. And at some point, uh, in the future, we'll, as a church, get to chapters 13 and beyond. Maybe next year, we'll see. Uh, but for now, I wanted to focus on this next stage as the church begins to turn from being an inwardly focused thing on their specific city of Jerusalem to something that starts to look outward beyond the walls of the city. And I think this is an appropriate time for us as a church as we not that we've, we, we've been entirely inwardly focused and for the first time ever we're starting to look outside these walls. I, I hope that's not the case. Um, but as a church, we're trying to put greater emphasis on looking beyond these walls, on, on looking outward and on considering how God might want to use us 
in whatever sphere of influence we have in our day-to-day -day lives. And so I think these chapters are going to be particularly appropriate for us at this point uh, and where we are as a church. To understand a little bit more of what's going on, I want to give us kind of a running head start going into chapter 8 just so that we see where the story is at with the early church. So chapter 1, as we looked at Jesus' last words, he ascends to heaven, um, and the, the chapter ends with uh, the disciples gathered together. They, they vote to replace uh, someone, or they don't vote, but they, uh, they cast lots to find a disciple to replace Judas, who had betrayed uh, Jesus and committed suicide. And so they, 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 they want the 12 again. They cast lots. Matthias is chosen. They're, the 12 are there, and they're essentially hanging out in Jerusalem, waiting for the Spirit to come, as Jesus promised. Uh, chapter 2, the Holy Spirit descent, descends, comes to dwell in them. They start speaking in tongues. A crowd gathers, and Peter stands and powerfully preaches the gospel to this crowd that gathers on the day of Pentecost. And we're told at the end of chapter 2 that 3,000 people accepted his message and were baptized that day. In chapter 3, uh, Peter Hill heals a crippled beggar. A crowd gathers and he preaches the gospel. Again, there's this theme of something happening, a crowd gathering, and someone steps up to preach. Chapter 4, uh, Peter and John are arrested for preaching to the crowd. They're brought before the religious leaders and they say, okay, well, I guess we'll preach to you. And so they preach to the religious leaders that arrest them. The leaders don't quite know what to do with them. They let them go. Uh, chapter 5, the apostles continue healing and preaching and crowds gather. They're arrested again. Uh, this time an angel unlocks the, the prison doors. Uh, they walk out in the middle of the night and the next day they're back to preaching uh, to, to whatever crowds they can get. They're arrested again. This time they're flogged and at the end of chapter 5 we're told that they rejoice that they were counted worthy of suffering for the name of Christ. On chapter 6, uh, the apostles are getting bogged down with the distribution of food for widows Say, you know, we, we need to focus our time on prayer and the word of God, so let's find some uh, reliable, godly men who can oversee this ministry for us. And so they, they choose seven uh, godly, mature uh, men to be deacons, essentially, to oversee the benevolence ministry of the early church. Uh, one of them, a man by the name of Stephen, is arrested. And chapter 7 is is yet again, you know, something happens, you get a crowd. This time Stephen's arrested, he gets a crowd uh, of the religious leaders and others kind of standing by, and he, he preaches uh, essentially to the Sanhedrin, all the, the religious leaders, and chapter 7 is, is Stephen's long message to them. Um, it's a, essentially an overview of the Old Testament. If you feel like you don't know your Old Testament very well, just read Acts chapter 7, and you'll kind of get a big picture view of the Old Testament. Um, it shows that Stephen knew his Bible well. Um, but chapter 7 ends with, uh, with Stephen essentially calling them out for their rebelliousness. Look at uh, Acts chapter 7, verse 51. He says, You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you are just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your fathers did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him, you who have received the law that was put into effect through angels, but have not obeyed it. As you can imagine, they didn't take too kindly to his words. Uh, verse 54, when they heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. And essentially they dragged Stephen uh, out of the city and stone him to death. And we're told Acts chapter 8 verse 1 begins with this observation that Saul was there giving approval to his death. It's, it's this interesting little moment of foreshadowing as Luke, the author of this uh, book, gives us just kind of a little glimpse of what's to come. It's this little, where Saul is for the first time kind of introduced here and we're going to find out more about him, not only in our passage for today, but um, in Acts chapter 9 as uh, Saul is converted and, and becomes the apostle that we uh, typically refer to today as Paul. And uh, 
so, 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 so Luke is just kind of foreshadowing that. Saul is there. He's giving approval. And, and this moment is, is a significant turning point for the church because we read in the rest of verse 1 that on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. And notice those words, they're scattered throughout Judea and Samaria, exactly how it was phrased in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, when first you're going to be with my witnesses in Jerusalem, then in all Judea and Samaria, and then the ends of the earth. And it's interesting how God prods them along, you know, he's trying to get them out of bed and doesn't seem to be happening, they don't seem to be moving beyond the walls of the city, and it's persecution that essentially tosses them off the mattress and forces them to begin spreading out and carrying the message beyond Jerusalem. You see, the church up until this moment had been primarily a come and see religion. Uh, the, the disciples start speaking in tongues, people come and see what's going on, and Peter preaches. The disciples perform miraculous he healings, people come and see what's going on, and Peter or John or someone preaches. The religious leaders arrest them, and one of them, usually Peter, stands up to preach to them. Uh, every time, it's, it's again and again, something happens, and, and, and then they preach, and the same thing begins to happen with the deacons that they appoint. Stephen does miracles, crowds gather, he preaches, he gets arrested, he preaches again. You know, wherever I can get a crowd, the gospel comes out. But it was primarily a come and see, whether it's miracles, whether it's good works, whether it's being arrested, whatever it is, whatever gathers the crowd, um, it's, it's, it's a come and see approach. And if we were to back up further, I think the same could be said overall of the Old Testament. Uh, it wasn't exclusively a come and see uh, religion. There's, you've got you know, Jonah being commanded to go to Nineveh. Uh, you've got some Old Testament prophets that were speaking to nearby uh, nations. But primarily, Old Testament Israel ha had a come and see religion. There was a temple that was uh, covered in gold and beautifully adorned, and it was a come and see how we worship. There was a court of the Gentiles uh, as part of the temple grounds where Gentiles could come and see how the Jews worship, see what they do, and for that to be a place where they could pray and come to know this God as well. Come and see the temple, come and see the rituals, come and see the festivals, come and see the laws that set us apart from all the other nations of the world. It was primarily an attractional come and see approach to evangelism. And in the New Testament, this flips upside down. And there certainly is some come and see in the New Testament, as the first seven chapters of Acts demonstrates. And if you look in the Gospels, Jesus does some come and see. And I don't think, I don't think we are taught in the scriptures or in the New Testament that we should never ever do a come and see type thing again. Certainly there's a place for come and see ministry. And I think we can and ought to continue to do things like that. Come and see my church. Come and join us on a Sunday. Come to this event that, that we're hosting where you might hear the gospel. It's okay to do come and see. We want to continue to do some, some come and see ministries here as a church. But in terms of the balance, in terms of, of the emphasis, there's been this shift from the attractional come and see to the missional go and tell. And without a doubt, that becomes the emphasis in the New Testament. The Great Commission is a commission to go and tell. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Now, Jesus said in John 20, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. God wanted his people to go, to get out of their comfort zones, to move beyond what's familiar and easy and predictable. But they weren't going. So God did what any parent does when they don't want to get out of bed or they, when they don't want to move out of the basement. He turns the knob of discomfort to begin to motivate them to get out of their comfort zone and to do what's best for them and what's best for the glory of God. And so God's solution was 
simple, albeit painful. And we read that there's this persecution. Uh, again, reading Acts, second half of Acts chapter 8, verse 1. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. A small point that I want to make as I observe this, particularly verse 2, um, is that when, when persecution comes, godly men and women don't blame the people attracting the most attention. I, I just want us to see that. This is not the main point of the sermon, but I at least want us to see that. They're not blaming Stephen for rebuking the religious leaders and for, uh, you know, kind of inciting this persecution. They're honoring him by burying him. They're mourning deeply for him. They, they could have said, see how stupid Stephen is? You know, he was speaking up so vocally. We, we need to learn the lesson of just, we need to be quieter. We need to hush up. Let's learn the lesson of Stephen and not do what that crazy guy did. They could have taken that approach. They could have blamed Stephen, but instead they honored him and mourned for him. In our present day and age, I think this could be a lesson for us to learn as there are and, and will likely be continuing threats to our religious freedom and liberty here in America. It will be tempting to blame rather than to honor the Christians who attract the most attention. Now I want to draw a, a distinction because you can attract attention by your courageous love and you can attract attention because you're being obnoxious and, and you know I want to draw that distinction Westboro Baptist Church attracts a lot of attention and they get some opposition it's not because they're courageously loving people it's because they're being idiots and picketing funerals and and twisting the word of God to, to attack people with it um, they deserve whatever opposition they get but in the days to come, I think it will be increasingly common, at least I expect if, if the trajectory continues, uh, that it will be more and more common for Orthodox, Christ-exalting, Bible-believing Christians and churches to face opposition and persecution here in America, whether from the general population or from the government. And I hope that we will be the kind of people that don't blame the, the Christians that are attracting, the, the, you know, the bright lights that attract the most bugs. I've shared that Rick Warren quote before, you know, brightest lights attract the most bugs. And I hope that we don't blame the Christians or the churches that tend to shine the brightest and get the most heat for it. But I pray that we're going to honor them and stand with them. And hopefully we will be the kind of church, not that I welcome and want the persecution, but I pray that we would be the kind of church that doesn't shrink back but stands courageously regardless of what opposition may come our way. So, so the church is being persecuted. Saul is destroying the church. The Greek word there uh, is a word typically used to, to animals that are devouring and kind of ripping apart uh, their prey. And this is what Saul is doing to the church. He's going from house to house, dragging off men and women and putting them in prison. And what does the, what, what does the church do? Uh, we're told that they scatter throughout Judea and Samaria. Look at verse 4. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. This isn't saying that everyone who was scattered became professional preachers of the gospel. Uh, that they all went into pastoral ministry and they all found these you know, pulpits or these soapboxes that they could stand up in the public square. This is not saying that every Christian who was scattered became a preacher. In fact, in Greek, the word preaches, I think here might be better translated, shared the good news. Um, it's, it's, it's the word from which we get gospels or the verb form. They evangelized. They shared the good news. This is not uh, some professional preaching. This is in whatever sphere of life they were in. They're not all getting up in the public square or standing up in their local synagogues. They simply shared the good news whenever they had an opportunity. They got settled into new cities and new communities. They met their neighbors. They went shopping. They went for walks. They got jobs, and they talked with their coworkers and their friends and the people they rubbed shoulders with 
every day. This sharing of the gospel may have been, there may have been times where you have a crowd and you've got an opportunity. And we're going to see with Philip later in chapter 8 some opportunities that he gets. But I would imagine that the majority of the evangelizing that took place was done by unnamed everyday Christians who simply had conversations with their barber, their dentist, their whatever, you know, their, uh, their grocer, their um, whoever they, they bump into as they walk around and do their business. They have conversations. They share life. And they share, as they talk with people, they share the gospel. They share the good news of what God has done for them in Jesus Christ and the difference that Jesus has made in their lives. For the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at the rest of chapter 8 and specifically looking at Philip and his ministry. Uh, For now, I just want us to individually and collectively pause and consider whether we will be the kind of people and the kind of church that goes and tells or simply hopes others will come and see. Uh, Two weeks ago, I shared, kind of on behalf of the elders, I shared uh, a part, you know, our, our threefold vision for where we think God is taking us as a church and what we feel like God wants us to focus most on in the coming years as a church. And the third part of that vision statement was this. I said that we endeavor to be a church made up of people so in love with God and on board with God's mission that we effectively live out and share the gospel in every sphere of life. That's, we, we, we endeavor, we're going to put effort into this, we're not going to be passive, to be, to be a church made up of people so in love with God and so on board with God's mission that we effectively live out and share the gospel in every sphere of life. As elders, we, we, we kind of, I think in, in a necessary way, kind of like struggled with every word of these statements that we put forth, you know, trying to find the right way, the best way to say it. And we debated amongst ourselves whether we should use the language of missional or attractional. Um, And other than the fact that a lot of people aren't familiar with those words and they might carry some baggage as you attach certain meanings to them. But but we, we, we debated about how much we should try to explain this difference between an attractional come-and-see approach and a missional go-and-tell approach. And, and, and we just, we worded, we didn't use those words, but we worded it in such a way to make it clear that the emphasis that we see in the scriptures is an emphasis that we are living out and sharing the gospel in every sphere of life, that, that we're not simply inviting people to come hear the pastor share the gospel, but that we are people who are going and telling, uh, that we are bringing the gospel to bear everywhere that we go. Uh, Paul in Ephesians 4, uh, verses 11 and 12, uh, he writes this. He says that he gave, so, he, he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ. I want us to hear that. So apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, which is another word for pastors and teachers, these are given. What is a purpose for these leaders that God has blessed the church with? Their purpose is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Uh, J.D. Greer is the pastor of the Summit Church in uh, Durham, North Carolina, and he has jokingly kind of tongue-in-cheek but still with a certain seriousness uh, told his church that when he became a pastor he left the ministry Um, because strictly speaking as a pastor our role is to equip the church for ministry so he said when I became a pastor I left the ministry um, because he recognized at that point that was the point at which the congregation the people everyone else the saints God's people it's it's we together Um, do the work of ministry. You don't hire a pastor to do ministry for you. You hire a pastor to equip you to do ministry. And I think that perspective is is so important. It it affects how you view Andy and myself. It affects how you view the elders. It it affects how you view the role of the church itself. You know, do, do we exist to do ministry for you? Or do we exist to help you more effectively do ministry? Because that's that's the biblical Emphasis. I should not be the first one that your neighbors hear the gospel from. 
nor should I be the first one to visit one of our members during a time of suffering. Well, that's the pastor's job. He goes to the hospital. But, but we are the church. We are doing the work of the ministry. And I'm going to do my best to try to be someone that sees people in the hospital and that calls to check in. Um, but, but sometimes people complain like, well, the, the pastor hasn't come. You know, the church doesn't care about me. Well, did anyone else? Well, yeah, this person came and this person came and this person came. And, well, praise the Lord. The church is doing the work of ministry. And I don't say that to like try to wash my hands of it and kind of sneak away from responsibility. But for us to rightly view why Andy and I are here in the first place. Uh, we, we exist to equip you to do the work of ministry. And certainly you can and should invite people to church. I'm not discouraging you from things like that, inviting people to church or inviting them to bubble soccer, inviting them to trunk or treat or any number of, of things that we might do as a church to try to connect with our neighbors. But we want to balance this attractional come and see uh, approach with the missional go and tell. And if there's an emphasis, if, if someone were, was to just come in and observe our church, I hope they see a whole lot more of the go and tell than the come and see. Because we are the church together, all of us doing the work of ministry with our families, our neighbors, our co-workers, our friends. I think this vision from the elders is one of you know, the, the, the loving ways that God is prodding us in the right direction as a church. But I ask, will this prod be enough? Or will God need to turn up the discomfort knob? Uh, will God need to do more than simply cast vision through the elders or through my preaching? Will God need to do more than that to get us out of our comfort zones, to get us beyond a come and see so that we, we begin to live out a go and tell? Will, will, will my preaching and this vision, will that be enough of a prod or is God going to have to turn up the heat a little bit? Will, will he have to turn the lights on and rip off the sheets and tip over the mattress and, you know, spray you with a hose. Maybe you've gotten desperate enough as a parent. You know, come on, get out of bed. Uh, what, what will it take for us as a church? And, and to wrap up, I want us to think of four specific things that, that I think might be holding us back, that I think might be holding you back. If you have difficulty sharing your faith with friends, families, neighbors, coworkers, um, I, I want to ask you, what's holding you back? And my guess is that it's one of four things. Uh, as I thought through this, I think there are at least four things that keep us comfortable, and each requires a different solution. Number one, um, you lack motivation. I'll, I'll say them first, and I want you to write down the one or circle the one uh, if you can. If you've got a pen, if you've got notes, write down, circle the one that you think most fits you. You lack motivation. Number two, you lack confidence. Number three, you lack courage. Number four, you lack time. I think these four things, they're not the only four things, but I think they're probably the main four things that might hold us back from going and telling, from making efforts and sharing the gospel. We lack motivation. We lack confidence. We lack courage. We lack time. So number one, lacking motivation. If you find yourself apathetic, lacking motivation, you're simply not that motivated. You know that you should, and maybe the, the, the guilt trip from a sermon like today kind of lingers with you for maybe four to six hours, but by Monday morning you wake up and you find yourself like, yep, back to work, whatever. Um, you, if you just find yourself just not very concerned about your neighbors, you don't think about the, the significance of so, something like hell, you don't think about the difference it could make in their lives. You don't really care about what they're going through. If that describes you, then I think what you need more than anything else is to dig deeper into the gospel yourself. Uh, if you find yourself lacking the motivation, my guess is it's because you lack motivation overall in your walk with the Lord. My, ga my guess is, is that if, if you're if you're not very motivated to evangelize, you're probably not very motivated to open your Bible in the first place. Maybe not very motivated to worship or to praise. And I think you need to start there. Like, dig into the gospel. Get some disciplines in your life. Get some people. Repent. Find someone that you can confess to. And, 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 and 
dig deeper into the gospel. Open up the word of God. Listen to some sermons. Read some books. Do whatever you can. Get around some people who are excited, who are passionate, that it might rub off on you a little bit. Do whatever it takes to grow in your love for God and for others. Make it a priority to nourish your soul. If your soul is shriveling, it's like asking someone who hasn't eaten in a week to run a marathon. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, like, you know, if, if you have no energy, you're not going to do much. If you're not feeding and nourishing yourself in the word of God, in prayer, if you're not drawing close to God, if you're not moved by who he is, then you're not going to be moved enough to tell someone else about him. And any, any kind of preaching about, you got to go and tell, you got to go and tell, it's just going to bounce off of, of hard hearts and dead ears because you got to start with falling more in love with God and feeding your soul so that you have the motivation from which to share the gospel and talk with others. So if you lack motivation, confess that to someone, repent of that, pray to the Lord to change your heart and dig into his word that you would kind of take whatever little embers are there and to begin to fan that into flame so that your love for God begins to grow and that right motivation, which, which we included in our mission statement, that we're going to be, or our vision statement, that we're going to be so in love with God and on board with God's mission that we effectively live out. So if you're not there, uh, deal with that first. Uh, number two, if you lack confidence. Uh, in other words, there's a fear of failing. Learn how, because it's not that complicated. Uh, we're going to provide opportunities as a church where we can learn more about sharing the gospel so that you can understand it better, so that you can summarize it better, so that you can know how to initiate conversations better. Uh, as elders, we want to continue to do things as a church to teach us and equip us to better share the gospel. So if you lack confidence and you're afraid you're just going to mess it up as soon as you try, um, then, then deal with that, address that. Don't just be passive, but read books on evangelism. Take classes, show up when we provide things, and go beyond this church. Look online, find whatever you can. Talk to us, because we have resources uh, beyond what we might be doing on a regular basis here. Do what you can that you would address this fear of failing and this lack of confidence, that, that with the motivation there, then you've got the confidence to go and do that. So lack motivation, lack confidence. Number three, lack courage, because there's a fear of opposition. I would say learn about your identity in Christ. Uh, learn about who you are in him and find out where your worth and value comes from. Paul was, I have a hard time thinking of anyone more courageous in his evangelism than the apostle Paul. And he says in Galatians 1.10, he says, Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. It's like, I, I don't exist to just make everyone happy. I exist to serve and to please my God. And when you are so grounded in his love for you and what he wants for you, and like you're just so connected with him, then he is your focus. And this fear of opposition begins to fade away. So if you want to learn more about your identity in Christ, if you want to learn more about, about his lavish love for you, talk to me. I'd love to give you some resources to help you dig deeper into that. Um, so we, we want to overcome these things and not just say, well, yep, you know, this is keeping me from evangelizing and I'm never going to do anything about it. Let's do something about these things. So lacking motivation, lacking confidence, lacking courage, fourth, lacking time because you're just too busy. <laughs> My advice here is pretty obvious. It's not rocket science. Cut some stuff out. You know, if something is important to you, you will make it a priority. Cut some things out of your life. Schedule efforts to reach out to your neighbors or invite people into your home. Make it a priority. I think it was C.S. Lewis who said that busy people are lazy people because they're too lazy to figure out what really matters and focus their time on that. If you're busy, it might be because you're too lazy to figure out what really matters. Um, I'm not trying to be insulting or whatever with that. I'm just trying to say, like, look at your life and see what can be cut. It, I, I don't think God is going to buy it when we say, I was just too busy to ever talk to anyone else about my faith. I was just, I was just too busy. He's going to say, yeah, right. You weren't too busy for binge watching Netflix. You weren't too busy for, you know, whatever else you might have spent your hours on. It's just about making it a priority. 
So for you, do you lack motivation? Do you lack confidence? Do you lack courage? Do you lack time? I pray that we would own up to whatever it is that's holding us back, that we would be a church um, that, that doesn't just say come and see, but that we go and tell. Now let's pray together. Now, Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your loving prods and pushes and exhortations and warnings. God, we want to be a church. We want to be people that don't let our, our lack of motivation keep us down, that don't let our lack of courage hold us back, that don't let our lack of confidence uh, dictate our future, that don't let our lack of time be the end of the story. But God, that we would be people who repent, who confess, who plead with your spirit to, to spark life in us, to change us, to guide us, to give us a wisdom. You say that if any of us lacks a wisdom, to come and pray, and, and you love to give wisdom to those who ask. Help us to be people that ask for wisdom about what to do and what to cut and how to re reorganize and rearrange our lives. God, help us to be a church that doesn't cling to comfortability, but is ready to step out of our comfort zones and to go and tell that others might know and embrace and love you as their Savior and Lord. We pray this in your name. Amen.